better looking crowd than we had last service. So, so, so. But I sure hope y'all are ready to worship. God be the glory. Oh, 
Praise the Lord. Welcome this morning to our service, 11 o'clock service today. Glad that you are here with us. Good to see some of our people finally coming back into service. It's great to be able to do that. Amen. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord for the opportunity. I'm hoping that first Sunday in July, we're going to start back like we usually do. We'll Sunday school and then our morning worship service on first Sunday in July. We won't start back the nursery or children's church then, but we'll probably work that in in the month of July sometime. But I do want to try to start back on the first Sunday in July with Sunday school and our worship service. So pass the word on to other uh, people of our church. I'm also going to uh, put an announcement out. Of course, I'm live today on Facebook, and we welcome all you who are watching us on Facebook this morning. But you're here to worship with us. We praise God for your attendance as well, uh, being with us today. We want to start out this morning looking at Psalm 119 again, just a section of Psalm 119. Uh, I said that the morning service, a 9 o'clock service this morning, If you, most of your Bibles will show this. Uh, Psalm 119 is broken into different sections, and it goes according to the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, and this section uh, is a different letter of a different section of the Hebrew alphabet, verses 17 through 24, as we do our morning reading in Psalm 119. Of course, this whole psalm is about the word of the Lord. So as we're getting ready to hear from the word of the Lord, we want to get our hearts and minds on him that we may receive his word. Psalm 119, verse 17. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also said and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counsel. Well, let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the public reading of the Holy Scriptures. And help us, O Lord, that we would meditate upon your statutes, upon your word. That we would hide your word in our hearts that we will not sin against you. Give us understanding, wisdom, and knowledge in the scriptures today, Father, that you may speak to us and help us to apply what we hear in our lives to live in obedience to you. Father, we come to give you praise and worship this morning. We're grateful for giving us another Sunday and another opportunity to assemble together in the name of Jesus Christ to worship you and praise your name. To God be the glory. What a true song that is, O oh Lord. God, we're grateful for who you are and for all that you do. We praise you, God, for your grace and mercy that you show us every day of our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for being the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for coming into this world and living the life that you lived and dying the death that you died that we could be saved and redeemed. Thank you for your resurrection and your exaltation into heaven. Today you are seated at the right hand of the Father where you ever live to intercede on our behalf. We praise you this morning, Lord, and we're grateful for the promise of your soon coming. Father, we pray as we continue to worship that, God, you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to hear from you today. I pray for the anointing of the Spirit to be able to preach again this morning, for the power and the strength I need, God, to be able to expound the Scriptures. God, help the hearers today who are here and who are watching live on Facebook or who may watch this video later. I pray for them, Lord, that you help them to be attentive to the Word with understanding and a desire to walk in obedience to you. I pray for the sinner's heart that you would... Draw those souls to you, Lord, with brokenness over their sins, with godly sorrow that would lead them to repentance and faith in you, Jesus. Have your way. We pray for this nation. We pray, God, that you would turn our nation to you. With so much wickedness and evil and hatred and division in our land, Father, we need you, God. We need you, Lord, to work and to draw people to yourself. We pray that you would use us, even here in our communities, to be that light in darkness, to be the salt in this world that you've called us to be. Help us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us, O oh Lord, to see people come to you, Father. We pray that you would stir up a revival and a spiritual awakening in our land, that people would trust in you, God, and turn to you. Help us to love our neighbor as ourself for your glory and for your honor. Bless those who are sick and hurting this morning. Those on our prayer list, we lift up to you and pray for. We ask for you to heal and touch Jolie today, God. Be with her and bless her. 
We pray for Larry Kirksey, God, that you bless him and heal his body. Help him through the rest of his treatments, Father, we pray. Be with him, encourage him. God, we pray for Tim Baudry today that you touch him and help him in his therapy. God, just strengthen his body, we pray. And you'll bless him today, Lord Jesus. We pray that you bless that family, God. We pray, God, for those who are grieving today, that you give them peace and comfort that passes all understanding. Be with all those, Lord, on our hearts and minds, we pray in Jesus' name. We love you and give you praise and glory. Amen. In and out of situations that tug of war at me all day long I struggle for answers that I need but then I come into his prayer and all my questions become clear And for that sacred moment No doubts can interfere In the
of the King. Amen. And we got a verse to say with this song. Psalm 140, verse 13. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jacob. Praise God for that. Amen. Yeah. For those of you watching uh, in my family back home on Facebook, that's Joseph's little brother. I thought I'd let them know that. Thanks. <laughs> 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 All right, let's take our Bibles this morning, open to the book of Revelation, chapter number 19, as we're continuing our look at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, um, the passage is verses 11 through 21 that covers this. Of course, right now we're in the middle of that in verse 15 this morning, as we continue to look here at this great thing that's going to happen that we're all looking forward to that all the bible points to the second coming of jesus christ god setting his kingdom up on this earth you know even in the model prayer that jesus taught us how to pray on the sermon on the mount in that prayer he prayed we are to pray that the father's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven amen so this is what all the bible is pointing to or looking toward is the coming of the kingdom of god upon this earth and I'm, for one, am excited about this promise that we have and this truth that we see. And I'm looking forward to that day when Christ does return. Of course, the rapture is going to take place before that, and we'll be with him in heaven, and we'll come back with him. But I'm excited about this passage of Scripture we're looking at and studying. Of course, I've been going through it slow. Some people may think I'm bogged down because I'm only doing, like, verses at a time or parts of verses at a time. But I want to bring out everything that I can uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course, to teach you all the facets about uh, what's going to be going on when Jesus Christ does come back. So if you have your Bibles open and if you're able to, please stand with me in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. I'm going to read the whole passage, verses 11 through 21. May we hear from the word of the Lord. <clears throat> now saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the public reading of your holy scriptures, and we're grateful for this passage of scripture that we have today of your second coming, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that great promise that we have to look forward to and the blessed hope we have in you, Jesus. One day you're coming back to this world, and you will rule and reign sovereignly with all power over all nations upon this planet. Lord God, I pray that you help us to share this truth with others around us. I pray that you would speak to us today now as we look at this, and God, you would grow us in your grace and knowledge. I ask that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Speak through me into the hearts and lives of all the hearers this morning. I pray if there's some listening today who are lost in sin, that today, God, you would break their hearts with godly sorrow over their sins that would lead them to repentance and faith and trust in you. Have your way this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. As 
You know, I, it's, it was so many weeks I wasn't able to say that or do that, but now that everybody's coming back to church, I get to say that and get to hear y'all respond. So I, I appreciate that. I missed y'all so much, and I love you. Good to be back together. All right, thus far in our study of this section on the second coming, go ahead to the next slide, Chris. Uh, we've seen the first two. Remember, I told you I divided this section into three different parts or three different points. We've already examined the first two points of this. We look, first of all, at the description of, of the king, the description that John and how John describes Jesus in verses 11, 12, 13, and verse 16 shows us that. We spent a few weeks on that. And then the last week we looked at the second point. It was the disciples of the king. And we saw that they were two different groups. They were the angels who would come back with Christ. All the angels returned with the Lord. And then we saw three divisions of the saints of God, the rapture church, the tribulation saints, and the Old Testament saints all would come and return uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we began the last point of this section of Scripture uh, that I titled The Destruction by the King. The Destruction by the King. And we saw the first point of that, which is his weapon. And verse 15a tells us about that. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nation. So this sword that proceeds from the mouth of Jesus Christ is not a literal sword, this is figurative language. It is his word. The sword represents or symbolizes his spoken word. There is power in the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, he has power to create. It also has power to destroy. It has power to pardon, but it also has power to condemn. His word is omnipotent, meaning it is almighty because he is omnipotent. Are almighty. With his word, he will vanquish his enemies at the battle of Armageddon. He will separate the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goats, proclaiming judgment upon the tares and the goats. And now we move on to the rest of the destruction of the king. Or not rest, when I say that, I don't mean the whole chapter. We're not going to finish today. We're just going to look at the middle part of verse 15, the next point, which is his rule. We saw his weapon in the destruction that he brings. Now we're going to see his rule in the destruction that he brings. Verse 15b, it says, And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Now let's break that little short section of this verse down to see what this is talking about. The first thing we notice upon reading this is he himself will rule. He himself. And although it's true that the saints of God are coming back with Christ and we will come and rule and reign with Jesus upon this earth. The Bible makes that very clear. We talked about that last week, that we will come and rule and reign on this earth with Christ, but He alone is the sovereign ruler over this earth. Amen? He alone is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, so He has all the authority, all the jurisdiction to be the one who will rule. He Himself will rule. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will rule over His creation without any difficulty Whatsoever, it's not going to be hard for Jesus Christ to come back and to rule the nations of the earth. He's going to rule without interference. No one's going to interfere uh, with his rule. And he will rule without worry of being overcome or overthrown. Amen. Unlike uh, human rulers today who will worry about that, or even in our nation, uh, our, our people, our elected officials running for election this year, many of them are worried about maybe losing their position and being not elected in their position. But Jesus Christ is not worried. He's not fearful of losing his position. Amen? Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. Y'all sound good for Facebook people. Let y'all know. They can't see you like I, I can. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we notice that it is he himself that rules. The next thing we notice in this passage is the word rule. The word rule. He himself will rule. Now the word rule is translated from the Greek word poimeino. And poimeo, poimeino means to tend to a group as a shepherd tends to his sheep. Uh, it means to feed and to rule or have dominion over. It comes from the word in the Greek, pormain, which means a shepherd or a pastor. Now think about that. When we see this word rule here, he's referring to Christ's authority over the nations of the earth and also over us as well. It refers to him as a pastor or as a shepherd who tends his sheep. This word is very fitting to the Lord Jesus Christ due to how God chose to lead his people in the Old Testament, both in giving his law and the sacrificial system, and also in the royal line that Jesus would eventually come through. First of all, we see as God gives his law and the sacrificial system, it gives it to Moses, 
who comes to lead Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Now Moses, for 40 years before that, is a shepherd on the backside of the desert for his father-in-law in Midian. And so he's, God is training him as a shepherd, and he's tending to his flock, and he's taking care of that flock. He's training him for the purpose of being a shepherd of Israel to lead the Israelites out of bondage, out of Egypt. And then the royal line, David, King David, the man after God's own heart. What was he when he grew up? He was a shepherd. His father was a shepherd. This was his, their, this is their uh, job. This is what they did. And so he was trained as a shepherd growing up before he became the king of of Israel, So it's very fitting that this, root, this word rule would mean to shepherd or to pastor. It's also fitting considering that Jesus is called the shepherd in both the Old and the New Testament. In Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Jesus calls himself the shepherd in John chapter 10. First in verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life. For the sheep. And then in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. All, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen? And Jesus is telling them there that, listen, there's going to be other sheep that's coming into this fold that's not part of the fold now. And he's referring to Gentiles to those who aren't Jews. And this is, we're going to be one flock, both Jew and Gentile, redeemed and born again and saved. And we will be the flock, the sheep, underneath one shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus will rule his sheep like a shepherd who cares for, who loves, who tends to every need of his sheep and protects his sheep as well. So it's very fitting when we study the word rule here that it means pastor our shepherd, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing we notice in our verse is the instrument that he uses to rule. What does it say in verse 15? He himself will rule them with what? A rod of iron. A rod of iron. Now the phrase rod of iron that we see here is only found four times in all the Bible. Four times. It's found once in the Old Testament, and then it's found the other three times here in the book of Revelation. And I want to show you those. First one is in the Old Testament is in Psalm number 2. Now when you read Psalm number 2, and I've preached through Psalm 2 here in our church before. It is a psalm where God is declaring that he's going to set his son, Jesus Christ, on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, to rule all the nations. Amen. That psalm, that's what God's declaring there. So listen at Psalm 2. 8 and 9 as we talk about the rod of iron. Ask of me and I will give you the nations. This is the father talking to the son. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So from the very first time we see the phrase rod of iron referring to how Jesus will rule over the nations, the Father calls it that rod of iron or that scepter that he will use as king to rule the nations. The other three times we see rod of iron is here in the book of Revelation. The first time we see it is in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. And guess what? Jesus is quoting the psalm that I just read to you in that passage. In one of the letters to the seven churches, he's quoting that saying how he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The second time we see it in the book of Revelation, we see it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. In Revelation chapter 12 is the story of the woman who represents Israel and she's about to give birth to a male child which represents Christ and the dragon is trying to destroy and devour the child which represents Satan. And the child is born. And it says in verse 5 that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And then we get to see the last time that it's used in the Bible here, the text we're looking at this morning in Revelation 19, verse 15, telling us that he himself will rule with a rod of iron. Did you notice that this phrase is only used four times in all the Bible? But every time it is used, it is used speaking of how Jesus Christ will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Amen? And so there's no doubt. It's not referring to some earthly monarch or some earthly kingdom or some earthly king. There's no way you can look at it and try to put inference in it saying that it's just talking about something else. No. This rod of iron is talking about the scepter that King Jesus will use to rule all the nations of the earth when he comes back. 
We see in this verse, when it talks about that, it says, He Himself will rule them. Now, who is them referring to? It's referring to those in verse 15 that He strikes the nations with a, with a word that comes out of His mouth, the sword. That's who them is referring to, those nations whom He will strike. And they will be people who will survive the tribulation period, believe it or not. There are people who's going to survive through that horrific time and they will live into the millennial kingdom of Christ. They will live during that time and they will be human beings, not like us, because we are already glorified in our glorified bodies. We are in complete perfection, completely holy and perfect before the Lord. Amen? Uh, but these are still human beings, still living in fallen flesh. And they'll live into the millennium. They'll be married. They'll have, they'll have children. Children will be born. They'll grow up. They'll get married. They'll have children. So on and so forth throughout that thousand year reign of Christ. I'm going to get into some more of that a little bit later. My message is just going to share that with you. But Christ is going to rule over all the people of the earth throughout that thousand years with that scepter. Now, we think about the word rule, meaning to shepherd or to pastor. We, automatically, we think of loving care, don't we? And that's what we should think that as Christians because a shepherd, the, the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, he does tend to us in loving care, doesn't he? But also when we think about scepter, how he will rule or what he will use to rule the rod of iron, we think about crushing someone or we think about authority, uh, uh, making someone mind or making someone listen or bringing judgment. How do we marry those two together? How do we marry rule and rod of iron together? Well, it's very easy when we understand are we, are we consider, first of all, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, and I'm going to read that psalm to you because it refers to both of these in that psalm. It refers to him being our shepherd, and it also refers to the, of the rod of iron. It doesn't say rod of iron, but it refers to that rod in, in Psalm 23, verse 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. There it is. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Your rod, there it is, and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so we can see both things that we see here for Christ, the rule and the rod of iron, they are uh, referred to here in Psalm 23. Let me read you two from two commentaries about that. First of all, W.N. Thompson writes this, The shepherd invariably carries a staff or rod with him when he goes forth to feed his flock. It is often bent or hooked at one end, which gives rise to the shepherd's crook in the hand of the Christian bishop. With this staff, he rules and guides the flock to their green pastures and defends them from their enemies. With it also, he corrects them when disappointed and brings them back when wandering. End quote. Charles Spurgeon writes this in the Treasury of David. Thy rod and thy staff, by which you govern and rule your flock, the ensigns of your sovereignty and of your gracious care, they correct me. And so we can see that that staff, that scepter, that rod can be used not only to bring correction, but also it can be used to bring a, a, a vanquishing of his enemies, a driving out of the enemy. You think about the shepherd in the field watching over his flock, and he would use that staff to correct his sheep or to guide his sheep or to help his sheep, but he also used it as a weapon to fight against the enemies of the sheep. A wolf would come in and he could drive out the wolf or a bear or whatever it might be that would want to come and take away one of the sheep. He could drive it away with that rod. And so we can see that rod, that staff, the shepherd's rod is used to guide and protect the sheep and it's used to, to uh, drive off the enemies of the sheep. Since in the text we're examining Jesus is coming as king, this rod is his scepter that he uses to rule. How do we know that? Well, it's easy when you can think about it, him being king, it's got to be a scepter. But what really tells us that is the Greek word that John uses right here for rod. The word is rabdos. And it translate, can be translated three ways in the, in the English language. It can be translated to staff, to rod, which it is here, and to scepter. Either way. And so this is the scepter that Jesus Christ will use. All three are really fitting to Jesus Christ, that they are his staff, his rod, and his scepter. John MacArthur writes this in his commentary. The stern, swift judgment that marks the onset of Christ's kingdom will be the pattern of his rule throughout the millennium. 
During his thousand year reign, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will swiftly judge all sin and instantly put down any rebellion. All people will be required to conform to his law or face immediate judgment. End quote. Now think about this. There's going to be people, as I said earlier, that survived the tribulation. They're living over into the thousand year reign of Christ. They have children. Those children grow up. They get married. They have children. Those children grow up. They get married. We're talking about a thousand years. That's a long time to mankind. Amen? I mean, that's a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years, four hundred years, so on and so forth. That's a long time. So people, the population of the earth will begin to grow. Because if you look in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah tells us that when Christ comes back, many things are going to change. He's bringing back peace and prosperity to this earth. The millennial reign is going to be a time on this earth like has never been since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Even the deserts are going to blossom and bloom. Amen? There won't be deserts. They'll be blossoming and blooming. And there will be plenty of crops all over the earth for everybody to have. And people will live in hundreds of years. They won't die in the 70, 60, 70 days. They'll live in... Matter of fact, it says in Isaiah that if a baby dies at 100 years old, that'll seem strange. Think about that. In other words, a 100-year-old person is going to be considered as an infant or young in the early thousand year reign. 100 years would be like 20 years old now maybe, something like that, right? So people will live a long time. But they will live under his rule, right? Every nation will be under his rule. And his rule will be an absolute or kind of like an absolute monarchy. Now what an absolute monarchy is in human terms and a human government means a king ruling over his kingdom and he has absolute authority over every person in his kingdom. He can dictate to every person what he wants them to do and they have to follow his law. They have to follow it to the letter. If not, they have to suffer the consequence for it. That's an absolute monarchy. And Jesus Christ will rule with absolute sovereign power over his nations, but his is going to be a theocracy because he's God. He's going to rule all his subjects and they will be subject unto him. There will be no limits to his rule. There'll be no limits to his power. There'll be no limits to his will and what he wants to do. Amen? The authority that the saints have. Now, he's going to give us a jurisdiction and authority. We're ruling and reigning with him. He's going to give us some authority, some jurisdiction. But we've got to understand that authority is coming directly from our king. But listen, he won't have to worry about anything because we're in our glorified bodies. We're not going to rebel against him. We're not in this human flesh anymore that has the tendency to rebel against the Lord. Amen? So we won't rebel against him. This is how we know that during this millennial reign, the, the governments of the earth, the nations are going to stay here. And the governments of the earth won't be like they are now. They won't be ruled by human beings who are still in their fallen flesh, those who survived during the tribulation period. They won't rule at all because they have the tendency to do what? Rebel against the Lord. And so they won't rule at all. There will be no rogue rulers in, on the earth at that time. Only Jesus. Amen? There will be, however, a growing descent or rebellion against Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? During that thousand year reign, Jesus himself is going to be sitting on the earth in Jerusalem. And they're going to see him. Listen, there's festivals that's going to be going on every year in Jerusalem, and it, be, it will be our responsibility as Christians, wherever we're ruling or serving God at that time, it will be our responsibility to bring those people to those festivals. People are required to come to those festivals in Jerusalem. There's at least three I know of, and maybe five, in the Old Testament prophets that it talks about. And they will come to those festivals. One of them is the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm going to read the passage about that one in just a minute. But if they refuse to come to that festival, Christ is going to judge them by not allowing it to rain on their fields where their food, their crops are. It amazes me as I think about this and I study this, that people are living during the most, the, the, a time the earth's never seen since the fall of man. Think about that. Jesus is literally here on the earth. He's literally in Jerusalem. They can see him. They can hear him speak. They see the angels everywhere. Angels are no longer invisible. They're visible now all the time. They see us in our glorified form. And they're still going to rebel against Jesus Christ. They're still going to want to refuse to come. Now, it won't be that way in the first probably few hundred years of the thousand year reign because their minds will still be fresh with what happened in the tribulation period, especially that generation that survived that. And they lived through that. 
It impacted them. Amen. And then their children, they'll be impacted because they'll tell them the stories. But as the generations continue to go through those thousand years, and we get toward the end of that thousand year reign, guess what? It won't be as impactful anymore. What was yesterday? June the 6th. What happened in June 6, 1944? D-Day, right? I guarantee you that day was more impactful to that generation than it is to the generation living now. I'm talking about the young generation. Amen? That generation that lived through that, that was very impactful to them. That, that whole war, that depression and the war that they lived through, that impacted their lives. And it impacted the rest of their lives. Right? The generation that's living now, World War II and the things, how socialism and Nazism and all that stuff was, that's not impacting this young generation no more. We can see it evident right now in our cities, can't we? Those who want socialism in this country and communism in this country, they don't understand what they're saying. Right? So we can see even in just a short amount of time, in just 70, 80 years, how it's lost its impact already. Imagine now hundreds of years go by in this thousand year reign and the impact of the tribulation will lose its weight and people will begin to want to not go to Jerusalem. They want to make that trip three times or maybe five times a year. They don't, they don't want to do that. And so Christ will judge them by not letting it rain on the earth. Let me read that. Zechariah chapter 14, the Old Testament, verse 16 through 19. The prophet Zechariah writes this, It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations, this tells us people are going to survive the tribulation, everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles. That's one of them. I told you about it. It shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them, there will, shall be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This tells us a couple things. First of all, he mentions Egypt by name. What does that tell us? That the nations will still have the same names they have when he comes back. So the United States of America will still be called that during the millennial reign of Christ, but it will be ruled by Christ Jesus, not a form of democracy or republic government anymore. It will be ruled by Jesus Christ. Okay. Also, it tells us that some nations will rebel, not just Egypt, but other nations as well. And when they do that and rebel and not want to come up to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ at these festivals, then he will not allow it to rain on their crops. John Phillips in his commentary writes this on that passage. Toward the end of the millennium, disaffection will begin to take root among dissidents and old hostilities will breed and fester. Although the millennium will be glorious, Although the curse will have been removed from the earth, and although wickedness will have been punished and restrained, the golden age is not the eternal state. Unregenerate men will still be unregenerate men. During the first centuries, there will be no desire to rebel. The memories of the tribulation and judgment will be fresh in the minds of men, and they will enjoy the novelty of peace and prosperity. For a few more centuries, no one would dare to rebel. But during the latter centuries, some will rebel and they will be punished, end quote. So as time passes by in the millennial reign, those who are born and grew up in the last few centuries, they won't have the memories of the tribulation of the second coming of Jesus. They might hear the stories, but they won't, it won't impact them. They will not experience the destruction and devastation that Satan can bring. Because remember, Satan is in the bottomless pit during this thousand-year reign. He's been chained. So he's not able to go out into the world to cause havoc and confusion. He's not able to go walk to and fro upon the earth and bring death and destruction. And so they don't experience that at all. They've never experienced that at all in their lives. Yet they are still unregenerate souls. They are still unborn, spiritually speaking. They have not been regenerated or born again. They still must be saved. Amen? They still must be born again. And believe me, now there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be born during the millennium that they will be born in. They'll see Jesus, they'll trust in Christ, and He will save them. There's going to be multitudes who will not. 
And this shows us, because of how these people rebel, they are actually can see Jesus. They can put their eyes on Him. They can hear Him speak. They see the angels. They see us. They see the prosperity Jesus brings to this world and the peace that Jesus brings to this world and still rebel against Him. That shows us the depravity of human heart. The human heart. That shows you just how fallen mankind really is. Amen? You know, you hear people say, well, you know, if I could just see God, I would believe in Him. No, you wouldn't. If I could see some miracle, I'd believe. No, you would not. You're not going to believe unless the gospel of Christ is preached, the Word of God comes in your heart, and Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit of God regenerates you and brings faith and life into your heart. Jesus told the, uh, I mean, not Jesus, but Abraham told uh, the rich man that was in hell. The rich man was begging him. For Lazarus to go back home and tell my, I got five brothers. Go tell them about this awful place that they won't come here. What does Abraham tell him? Oh no, they got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they got the word of God. Let them hear what God says. Oh no, Father Abraham, if if you if he rises from the dead, if Lazarus come back to life, they'll surely believe. What did Abraham tell him? He said, if they won't believe the word, they won't believe if one rises from the dead. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen? So people that say, if I could just, if God just show Himself to me, I'd believe. No, you would not. We don't choose God. He chooses us. We don't choose when we will believe in God. Listen, we wouldn't love God if He had not loved us. The Bible tells us that. It says we didn't love Him first. He first loved us. That's why we love Him. Amen? Because He shows us His love to us and He draws us to Himself and He saves us. Many will begin to turn against Jesus' absolute sovereign rule. This is how Revelation 27 through 10 is going to be fulfilled. I want you to look at that with me. Revelation 20, verse 7 through 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now how many of y'all been to the beach, or we live in Taylor County, been out in the yard because there's a lot of sand in Taylor County, and could count the sand that you're standing on? That's a lot, isn't it? The sand of the sea. Now think about that. Just really think about that. That's an innumerable amount of people that's going to turn against Jesus Christ at the end of this millennial reign. And these people can see Him, can hear Him, and knows what He's doing, and still turn against Him when Satan comes out of that bottomless pit and deceives the nation. And they're coming with the devil to Jerusalem thinking they can take over and knock Jesus off the throne to put their foot on His chest and knock Him off. And step themselves back up. And that's what man does now. They want to put their foot in the chest of Jesus and just knock him off and say, I'm the king of my life. I'm the Lord of my life. I rule my life, not you. That's rebellious heart of mankind. Amen? And so these people are going to be the same way. How in the world, after how they've lived and the situation they've lived in, it's never been this. I keep saying this, but I, you just got to understand it's never been this way on the earth since the fall of Adam and Eve. And they're going to live during that time. And they're still going to turn against Jesus. That shows you the depravity of the human heart. Amen? It shows you just how wicked man, man's heart is. They will stupidly follow the devil to thinking they can overthrow him. Look what it says in the rest of what I was reading to you in Revelation 20. In verse number, um, where was that? Verse number 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth, they being the armies, the innumerable amount of people. They went on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of all of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil was, who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is where God will judge the earth and burn it up with fire, the heavens and the earth, and he will create a new heaven and new earth as we see in Revelation chapter number 21. Listen, unless the human heart is changed by God himself, that person will always follow their flesh. Always. 100% of the time. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
In Romans chapter 6, verse 16 through 20, Paul writes this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? What he's saying is, he said, we're all slaves. Every one of us. Either our master is our sins or our master is Jesus. Amen? But we're all slaves. Every human being is a slave. We're the slave to our flesh, to our sins, our evil, wicked passions, or we're a slave to Jesus Christ. I hope you're a slave to Christ today. He says in verse 17, this is the way we were. We were slaves to sin, leading to death. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that which you were delivered. And what he's saying is the gospel, the form of doctrine, the gospel of Jesus Christ has come and has been preached and you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and because of that, now you're no longer a slave to sin but a slave to righteousness. You've been changed, amen. You've been born again. He goes on to say, and having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, Paul says. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Slaves of sin and free from righteousness means we were powerless to pursue any righteousness on our own. We had no power in ourselves to pursue the righteousness of God. We could never do good things in the sight of the Lord. Now, in humanistic views, people do good things, and we think that's good or that person is a good person. But in the biblical perspective, not one person outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ is any good whatsoever. We can't do good at all. Bless you. We're slave to sin. As a matter of fact, it tells you how people live. It says, when we are slave to our uncleanness, our sins, what does it tell us? We practice lawlessness that leads to more lawlessness, that leads to more sin. We get worse and worse. We don't get better without Christ. This world's getting worse and worse. It's not going to get better without Christ. Amen? Evolution is a lie. Evolution says things are getting better. We can just look at it and know that's a lie. It's, not, it's devolving, not evolving. Amen? Everything is getting worse and worse. This is the opposite teaching about man's free will to choose Christ when they're ready to. Amen? You would never choose him if he had not chosen you first. That's Bible. That's Bible. Amen? In 1995, June 1995, I got saved. I'm coming up on my birthday, my spiritual birthday. Amen. I didn't. I didn't get up that Tuesday afternoon. I worked the night before and got up that afternoon. It was a little after twelve or one o'clock. I can't remember. I got up that afternoon and I didn't get up that day and decide. You know, I'm. I'm 29 years old. Going to turn 30 that August. I, I think it's time I stop sowing my wild oats. I think it's time I straighten up. You know, I, I got kids. I need to. I need to be a better daddy. And, I need to be a better husband at the time. I need to straighten my life up. I need to go to church. You know, I, I know I grew up in church. I was ready. I know what I'm supposed to do. I need to go start doing it. Is that how it happens? That's what a lot of people think. I'm choosing now to follow God because I want to change my direction in my life. I, I want things to be better for me. Right? I have prayed, y'all. I've been a minister for many years now. I have prayed with people who are going through struggle and strife and trial in their life, and they're coming for God. They're coming to God only to get a fix, not to surrender their life to Him. They're not coming, God. If you don't change my situation, that's okay. I just want you. They're coming, God. You got to change my situation. Think about it. Amen. How should we come, God? I want you, whether I go to hell or heaven. I want you. It's not about that. me. It's about you, God. I want you. No, I didn't get up that day that way. I got up that day in brokenness because I was already being convicted of my sins through a man named Darren White, a good friend of mine, who stayed on me at work and witnessed to me and talked to me. I would tell him sometimes, shut up. Stop talking about that. I don't want to hear it no more. And you know why I was telling that? Because it was killing me on the inside. And I was being broken by God. And when I got up that day... 
I just felt in my heart, I, was, I, I sat down at the TV, it was around 4 o'clock by this time, and I was just flipping through the channels, and I came across a Christian station, and there was uh, John Hagee preaching. Oh, and he was preaching, and I don't remember what, where he was preaching in the Bible, but I do remember this. He pointed at the camera, and he said, Stop running from God. You can't run no more. And his finger hit my nose, and his words hit my heart. God spoke to me that day. I, I fell on my face on my living room floor, and I began to cry and weep. And I was broken, and I began to name them too, buddy. I was naming them. God, forgive me for adultery. Forgive me for sexual immorality. Forgive me for lying. Forgive me for all. I mean, I was naming them. I was coming clean with God. I was weeping. They were, I mean, literally, there was puddles of tears on the floor that day. We had an old ugly brown linoleum floor that, back then at that time. But, and when I got up out of that floor, Jake, Jacob, I was a different person. God saved me that day. He changed my life. And I ain't got over that yet, y'all. Amen. Praise the Lord. So no, we don't come to Christ when we get ready and choose Him. He chooses us and draws us to Himself, and that's when we choose Him. That's when we choose Him. Listen to Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. Paul writing, now he's writing to a church in Ephesus. These are Christians. He says, you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and it is Christ who's made you alive in Him. Now, you think about something that's dead, like a dead body, you go up to a casket, you could, sh you could, you could speak to that dead body, it's not going to talk to you, y'all. You can grab the hand of that dead body, shake that body, it's not going to respond to you at all. There's no life there. Life is absent from that body. Amen? And that's the way it is, spiritually speaking, to every human being who's not saved. There is no spiritual life, so they can do nothing to cause life in themselves. And there's nothing I can do to cause life into a dead sinner either. It takes the power of God to bring life to deadness. Just like the prophet Ezekiel, when God showed him that vision of the valley of the dry bones, and there were bones all over the place, and he said, speak to the bones. They may come together. He spoke, the bones came together and made a skeleton, but there's still no life. He said, speak to the bones again. And when he spoke, then the sinew and the ligaments and the skin, the muscles and the organs and all that, the body came together. It was a human body, but they still were dead. There was no life. God said, speak to it again. He speaks. This time, the wind came through the valley. The Holy Spirit came through the, whoo, the Holy Spirit came through the valley, and those bodies got up and begin to march like a great army because life entered those bodies. And the only reason life came is because God came. Amen. And that's the way it is when we're dead in our trespass and sin. It is He that made us alive. And now we can walk with Christ because we've been made alive. I'm still trying to train myself to stay right here so I get out. You know, they can't see me, but it's hard to do. <laughs> Let me read the rest of that in Ephesians 2, verse 2. He begins to talk about how we were in that deadness. You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, that's the devil, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. This was our nature, being children of wrath. In other words, we were worthy and deserving of the wrath of God every second of our life. If not for the grace of God keeping His wrath, we would be crushed under the weight of God's wrath. Verse 4, I love it. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. Listen. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. Even when we were dead we weren't alive to God. We didn't want God. We didn't love God. We didn't want to follow God. We would, we would do just like these people we're talking about here in our passage. At the end of the millennial reign, they're going to turn against Christ. We were the same way. Until the grace of God come to us. And He raised us up together. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. You hear that? that he might brag on himself, so to speak, God. He shows the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's exactly what man would do if they could save themselves. They'd brag about it. 
So a dead person can do nothing to live. It takes the power of God who alone can give life to bring life to a dead sinner. So no, you don't choose God until he chooses you. Amen? When he chooses us, that's when we make that choice. When our hearts are broken and the Spirit of God regenerates us, that's when we choose to follow Christ. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says this, But as many as received him, as received Christ, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, that word born is geneo in the Greek, it means to be born from above. Spiritual regeneration. Who were born not of blood. We weren't born again, but born by the spirit of blood, being born from my mom and daddy, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So those who have this free will mentality that they can choose God whenever they want to or they can lose their salvation, it tells us right there we're not born by the will of the flesh or the will of man. We're born of God. Amen? Steve Lawson in a sermon said this, the concept of free will to choose God is unbiblical and does not harmonize with the Bible. It is God who awakens the soul from sin to life. It is God who brings life to the dead sinner. It is God who chooses us for himself. End quote. And I'm glad. Because if it was up to me, I never would have chosen. Even that day, if I got up feeling bad about my life, I'd say, I want to I go to church. Because see, I did that. I remember when I went to the Navy, before I left to go to boot camp, I went to a preacher's house who used to go to our church where I grew up at. I loved this. He was an old man then. He's been, gone, been dead for many years. I just loved this man, Preacher Wood. That's what his last name was Wood, and we called him Preacher Wood. Well, he could shell the corn now. Some of y'all older people know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. <laughs> I went to see him because I'm finna go to boot camp. I went and talked to him, and I'll never forget what he told me. He told me, he said, no matter what you do in this world, if you don't follow Christ, it won't, make it, mount, it won't mount to a hill of beans. I mean, he was very direct with me, honest. I'm glad he was, but I didn't heed his words. I went to basic training. Every, every so often, they would allow us to go to services on Sunday, and I would go sometimes, and then sometimes I wouldn't go. I remember when that accident happened in front of me on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier in 1986. No, the first of 87, I'm sorry. I went to church a couple of weeks after that on, on the ship because it I scared me. But it didn't, I wasn't changing. What, nothing was happening in here. When I'd come home, I'd go to church. After I got out of the Navy, every once in a while, and when things were going not right, I thought not right in my life, I'd go to church. I'd get a Bible. I'd read my Bible. I'd try to change things, and then I'd go right back to my sins again. You see what I'm talking about? I'd go, I'd try to change. I couldn't change myself. I tried that. It don't work. But that day in 95, God got a hold of me. He did the changing. And he's still doing the changing. That work hadn't stopped. Amen. If you're experiencing conviction of sin, if God's dealing with your heart today, and he's drawing you, listen, don't wait. You get on your face right now before God and you call out to Christ Jesus. And let him save you. The Bible says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're calling on Christ and he's drawing you, you'll be saved. And I plead with you today to get right with God. It matters who you know when you leave this world. And you need to know Jesus Christ. As we close this morning, this text we're looking at today, we see in verse 15a that it is he, Jesus himself, will rule them, rule the nations with a rod of iron. His scepter, his rule will not change. Even at the end of that time, when the devil is, re is released and he brings that great army against Jesus, they still won't be able to knock him off his throne. Brother and sister in Christ, aren't you glad of that today? Yes. You know, we're in an election year in our nation, and I'm praying about that. I hope you are too. I'm praying, I'm praying against this socialist, liberal, progressive movement in our nation. I'm praying against that. I'm literally praying against it. And I'm praying for God to put people in positions in our government, even locally here in Taylor County, statewide in Georgia, and federal. I'm praying for God to put people there who will listen to him. Amen? But I'm trusting my king knowing that he's sovereign no matter what happens, even if November comes and goes and it don't go like I want it to go. I don't have to worry. 
I don't have to fear. Amen? Because my shepherd is always near. He's here to guide us and to lead us for the rest of our lives. And we can trust him. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful that you are our shepherd. And as Peter called you, you are the chief shepherd. There is no one above you. And you have the authority, the jurisdiction, and the power to rule all your creation. We humbly bow before your lordship. We submit ourselves to your lordship, Jesus, this morning. And we actively, intentionally, and joyfully want you to rule our lives. We want your rule in our hearts and our lives now, not just then. Lord, we ask that you help us to walk in obedience to you, to live a life in such a way that those who aren't following you can see you in us. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to love our enemies, to pray for them. Lord, to help them when they need to be helped. Help us, O oh God, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ as you love us, for that is a new commandment that you've given unto us to do that, that it brings you glory. Help us to do that, Lord, I pray. God, we pray that you would use this church family as we continue to serve you and live for you, God, that you would help us to make an impact for you in our community. We do pray for our nation. We pray for all of our leaders in this election cycle that you would put in place people who fear you, people who recognize you, God, and who want to follow you. I pray against this movement in our nation that would that is ungodly and wicked i ask in jesus name that you come against it father that you raise a standard against it lord that you drive it out of our land oh god i pray for those being deceived by it that you would help them to see the truth and the light and the life lord that they would have in you i pray they would come to you by faith and repentance of sin and i pray that your will be done oh lord in this world we love you god Lord, if there's one right now that you're dealing with that's listening to me this morning, that's watching this video, whenever they may watch it, maybe, maybe next week, I pray for them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, God, you would just help them to turn to you, help them to turn in repentance from sin and trust in you today, Jesus, and follow you, Lord. Have your way. Minister to those in need, I pray. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.